Well, good morning. Please pass your cards inside out. They'll be picked up at this time. Also, I'd ask that we all remember this afternoon to pray for our young people as they'll be traveling back. They'll have a safe return home. What I hear, the weather's supposed to be bad. You heard that too? Here we go. So, I want to uh, spend some time this morning on what I believe is a, a very important topic, uh, godly living and the family. And I remember years ago reading an article concerning the family and how children view love. Uh, kind of like uh, Art Linkletter's old program, you know, when kids say the craziest things. And, and uh, uh, they were asking young people to describe love and what love meant. They got some pretty interesting answers. Uh, for example... They had uh, someone named Jessica, age eight, says, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore, so my grandfather does it for her all the time now, even though he has arthritis in his hands, too. That is love. Anybody disagree with that? Okay. How about this one? Nika, age six, said, love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt, then he wears it every day. Nika, that's poor. That's not love. You understand? Um, but anyway, <laughs> Elaine, age six, says, Love is when mommy sees daddy all smelly and sweaty and still says he's handsomer than Brad Pitt. <laughs> and probably my favorite was this. Lauren, age four, said, When you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down really fast and little stars come out of you. <laughs> all of you are going to go home and ask your little kids what love is, aren't you? But there's beauty in this. I honestly believe, you know, I've heard so many sermons on the family, and I've preached so many sermons on the family. And as I said at the beginning of this, the reason for that, I believe it's one of the most important topics in the Bible, and one we must get right. I remember when my children were born, and I've told you about it many times, that, that, that flood of responsibility coming over me as I looked at my little children, and uh, one of the first things that happened, and you'll remember this, that when I first saw Karen, and, and uh, one of the nurses had taken her, and I saw the bottom of her feet, and uh, one of the things they were doing is thumping the bottom of her feet, and her feet were all black, and I thought, she's bruising the baby's foot. I didn't know what was going on. Of course, they're trying to make her cry and all that, and they'd, they'd taken the footprint you know, cause I didn't know these things, my first child and all this. And, and uh, then the second thing that really came over me was the idea that I get one shot at raising my children. One single solitary shot at raising those children in my home. And how for the most part I get those children for 18 years, although sometimes it turns into 40 or 50 but 18 years to, to, to do what I can. And I, I remember those feelings when my children went off to college and wondering whether or not I had taught them enough. When I say I, I mean Vicki and myself. If I had taught them enough to survive the world. And it's probably feelings that all of us have that love our families. But you see, the reality is we're probably all familiar with Joshua's battle cry, and I'll explain why it's a battle cry, in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, where he says, And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you, you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, sermons on that have been preached for years and years and years, and they're going to continue to be preached. And there's a reason for that. Why do I call it a battle cry? Because Joshua took seriously what the Word of God had to say, and he was stating emphatically that he would go to war for his God and his family. He was the type of guy, and it's from where I get the idea, that if Satan's going to enter my house, it's only going to be after the fight. That if I want to lose my children to the world, it's going to be after the fight. 
If my home dissolves, it's going to be only after the fight. Because the Word of God and God and His way and the family and those that I brought into this world, I feel an abundant responsibility. And I know you do too. So as we look at these things, Jeremiah told the people of Israel what it would take for them to succeed as individuals or as families. He just states it this way. He says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil. He goes on to say, To give you a future and a hope. Now listen to what God's telling the people in Jeremiah's days. My plan for you is for you to have a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God being very, very specific about the families, about what he wanted, about success, about how he felt about his people. And telling us later on in, in Isaiah 53, Isaiah does, about why Jesus came to this earth. About what his mission was. And the love that he had for all of us. Take a good hard look at that. A lot of you familiar with those? I remember those hard-toed shoes you would get. And my little girls both had the innate ability to whenever I'd pick them up, they always had to scrape along my shins with those hard toes. I don't know what it was. But I look at these and I, I remember a long time ago about success and hearing about success and that it's the same thing whether it's a an individual or an entire family and i remember a long time ago also that it occurs to me and to other people that it's whenever we call upon the lord we pray to the lord and seek god with all of our heart i mentioned about the baby shoes for this reason I saw a postcard one time that made quite an impact on me as a father. All those years ago when my kids were so young. And the postcard was simply a picture of what I just showed you. A pair of worn out baby shoes. It was a picture of the pair of the baby shoes and underneath it, below the picture were these words. Just a pair of shoes but a life in your hands. And I always took that seriously. Because all of us realize who have children that from diapers to diploma happens way too fast. I've been here long enough at this congregation that I remember some of you and I used to carry some of you. I was there when you were born. And you're looking at me and you're saying, you're old. But I do, I remember it. And some of you now have families of your own doing a marvelous job. I've had many of you that have come to me over the years, some in tears, and we've cried together about raising our children and raising them the right way and wanting them to go down the right path. And that's what family does. And I have to believe it because we all realize how important family happens to be. Listen, marriage is the oldest institution on this earth. You look at scriptures, and, and even though a lot of people don't go to these now, certainly we do in the church. Genesis 1.27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, what's he talking about? Well, that we all have a soul, that we have that spiritual side to us. We were created to live for, forever. And Genesis 2.22, And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And we understand why, to be the helpmeet for the man. Genesis 2.24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother. Oh, let me say that again. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It's the unity, the unification process that God says is right and proper. 
Now hold on, we're going to get to a point here in just a second. Jesus said, Matthew 19 and verse 6, reiterating what the, the Old Testament already said, so they are no longer two, talking about husband and wife, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now you see today, in today's society, the world's definition of marriage in today's society goes something like this in the minds of far too many people. Now keep in mind, this is not what I believe. But it's been expressed as an agreement in which two people, either a man and woman, man and man or woman and woman, agree to live together, accepting responsibilities and privileges incident there to the marriage, really, as long as they shall desire to live together. That's the world's view now. What's being taught, what's being accepted widely. Now, we look at this, and we understand from all of this that it's in the Word of God. It doesn't matter to the worldly-minded that the Bible never one time, listen to me, not one time does the Bible you're going to read ever condone the marriage of anyone other than a man and a woman, period. It just doesn't do it. You read Leviticus, you read other places, and it condemns the idea of man with man, woman with woman. You know that if you've been in the church any length of time. If you've read your Bible any at all, you can see this. Passages like, like Romans chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 2 about verse 10. You read passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 6 through 9. And it's very explicit, very plain that God condemns and it's an abomination. But see, it's the world versus what the Word of God has to say. Now you listen to all of this and it doesn't matter to the world that marriage is supposed to be for life. Sometimes some people have a, a, a mentality about it. You, know, you, you see in the world and, and you know, all of these different things that it just doesn't matter. It's kind of like a, a, a disposable thing that you know, if you don't, don't like, you just discard it. And the Bible says it should be for life. Now, of course, there are circumstances we know, death and adultery and stuff like that, which well, that's another sermon another time. But the world in which we live now doesn't concern itself as it once did with what, what the Bible directs us to do. Long time ago, well, I won't get into that. I'll, I'd, if I got on that point, I'd be on it for about ever. We should all listen and learn about what Isaiah the prophet says to Hezekiah about his house and why. Now, I'm going to read three different parts of what uh, Isaiah says to Hezekiah. And you just bear with me, and when I get through with this, I'll make the points. At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, you with me so far? sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah. Now, I had a motive behind it. For he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Another way of saying he was in a weakened condition. You listen to me? And Hezekiah welcomed them and showed them, now watch carefully, I have it underlined, and showed them all his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Now we'll go on to the next part. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say? And from where did they come to you? And Hezekiah said, They have come from a far country from Babylon. You ever heard of the Babylonian captivity? Here we go. He said, this is the prophet saying this, What have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. One other part, and we'll get to the point. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Now notice what's being said here. And here is the point when we get to it. In six verses, seven times, Hezekiah refers to his house being as either his or my house. Seven times in six verses. 
My house, my treasure, this is mine. I want you to notice something here. That there isn't one mentioning by Hezekiah of God and his describing what he possessed. This is mine, this is mine, this is all mine. The point of this account is that Hezekiah opened up his house to the enemy and the enemy conquered he, conquered him, conquered his family, took away everything that his father had left him. They just took it all. Matter of fact, the nation, the people of them, was taken in, in captivity by the Babylonians. Remember that? And the point of all this is that one of the main goals of parents is to make precautionary efforts not to expose your family to the enemy, the devil, because he will enter our homes to seek and destroy the family member by member. He doesn't care. I've known a long time. You have too. Satan doesn't care how old you are, what gender you are, what race you are, what color you are. He just doesn't care. So we look at these things, and, and here we go. So, as we bow before the Lord, fathers have specific responsibilities. Father in the Greek means nourisher, protector, or upholder. That's a big job, amen, fathers? Nourisher, protector, or upholder. In the Old Testament, the father had supreme rights over the children. I had forgotten our young people were going to be, for the most part, gone today. Because I really wanted to bring this to light to them. But anyway, fathers, I, I kind of think this would be a good idea today. Fathers had the right to dispose the daughter in marriage. That means see who she's going to marry. Father had a right to arrange the son's marriage. Wouldn't that be good? I'm just joking with you. I wouldn't want that responsibility, and I, I, I couldn't ask for better son-in-laws. Don't tell them I said that. But I, I really couldn't. If I had to go out and choose for my daughters, I couldn't have made a better choice than they made. But I'll be the first one to admit to you that growing up and some of the people they're dating, I doubted their selectivity. You know? Are you kidding me? You know, but anyway. Genesis 22 had the power of life and death over their children. Realize that? Exodus chapter 21, verse 17, anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. Wow, are you kidding me? All of this and still, in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, we are told to love and respect our parents. Not my design under the old law. It was the design of Almighty God. Now hold on just a little bit. We're going to get to something else. The following list mentions these things as the father's specific responsibility, but as a family unit. Both mom and dad should be involved with dad taking the lead and the wife supporting him in accordance with what the Word of God says. I think all of us understand that. The way we are to conduct our household in raising children involves these 11 things. This is not a, 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 a definitive list. It's not a, an all-inclusive list, but certainly these things, husbands and wives should be on board about re rearing and raising their children. Notice some of these things. We ought to be loving, Genesis chapter 37. I can find this in the New Testament too. I just put out some of the obvious. Husbands and wives, parents ought to be loving toward their children. Let me be the first one to tell you, you're going to see on this list, as family units, that doesn't mean we shy away from the idea of punishing our children or discipline. Some people have equated that to love your child, we would never lay a hand on our children. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible tells us that we are to discipline our children. Sometimes children deserve it. My dad invented time out. He took time out to whip me every time I needed it. I don't know how many belts he wore out, but he wore out a few, I'll guarantee you. Uh, every one but one I deserve. We won't talk about that one, it still bothers me. Husbands and wives, we need to be willing to follow God's will regardless of what it says. Start being, stop being argumentative toward the will of God and the purpose of God and follow the pattern of God and the home is going to fall into place. It's the way God would have us to be. I've preached it for years now. I believe it with every fiber of my being. 
when you have in a Christian home where there is a problem in the home between husband and wife, a serious problem, it's because one or both have walked away from the will or purpose of God or God's design. It's that way each and every time. Matter of fact, every time we are involved in something called sin, the same thing occurs. It's because we have either momentarily or altogether walked away from the Word of God. So, following God's will, it may not always be popular. Parents, I want to tell you this. By experience and talking to other parents, You're not going to be popular all the time with your children if you live a godly life. You listening to me? Hello? It's not always popular. Can I do this? Can I go to this? Can I be friends with this? Can I date this guy? Boy, you're going to face a lot of those things, but always stick to the Word of God. Listening to God's instructions, Proverbs 1. How about this? Encouraging your children. Nothing gets on my last nerve more than to hear a parent really put down in public their children. Weather alert. Put down in public their children like, like you know, my boy throws like a girl. Or my girl is, is this or all of that and, and yeah. The only thing that's that's tantamount to that, equal to that, is when I hear husbands and wives putting one another down in public. It's not cute. It's I don't care how much how great of an idea you may think that is, how funny you think you are. It is not right. Encouraging our children, you know, in a right way, training our children. Uh, you know, Hosea talks about it. Uh, Proverbs 22 and verse 6, training up a child. I've told you for uh, years now, that means to induce them to, to feed on the Word of God. But we train our children. We have one shot. And as I mentioned earlier, when they, they walk out that door and going to college and whatever, or, or getting married, you look at your children and, and uh, uh, you know, wanting to get married for the rest of your life. And the first feeling that comes to you whenever your, your children come to you and announce they want to get married, the first feeling I know that I have, that all of you have probably had, is great, they're getting out of the house. <laughs> no. You get that feeling like, whew, how much money do I have to spend on this bad boy? Uh, no. I had the feeling of, are they ready? Is it really my decision to make? Have we taught them enough? Have we set the proper example? I didn't worry about the girls taking the example of of a godly mother because they had that before them. I worried about whether dad had taught them what to look for in a man and had set a great example for that. I worried about those things. Rebuking them. This is something we talked about earlier. Being able to stand up and say, that's not happening. I don't care how popular. Anytime your kids look at you and say everyone else is doing it, I love that. Every time my daughters would say it, so everybody else is doing it, everybody else is wearing it, everybody else is going. All, uh, I love that argument because all I had to do is just simply say, so I can find, if I can find one person who isn't, then there, down goes your argument. Well, Dad, you know what I mean. You understand what I mean? It's not happening. You know why? Because I love you too much to let that happen. My decisions are based on my love for you and you being right with God. It's not about being popular with your friends. It's about being right with God. And we go here, punishing your children. Uh, Listen, um, well, you know as much of that as I do. Nourishing them, the Bible talks about. uh, We need to hurt when the child sins. Not just neglect it, but hurt when the child sins. Now listen carefully. We need to be considerate of our children when they sin, but not condone their sin. By considered, I mean understanding that we are sinners too. We don't have to be accepting of the sin. Sometimes tough love says, that sin's not taking place in my house. Everybody understands. So, you know, you have 
all these things are involved in what Scripture teaches us. We are not to provoke to wrath. Don't agitate them. Don't push them into something. You know, all these things are there. There is a, a way we can live, I believe. Uh, I just want to be totally and uh, biblically speaking accurate And when our families are beginning to be on the right track and heading down the highway of holiness. When does that happen? Well, I believe all of us can understand from my favorite part of Scripture, my favorite chapter in the Bible, read it many, many times in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. If you remember that, it says, Meanwhile, all Judah, this was never Jehoshaphat's about to go to war. And he finds this out and he bows before God. It says, Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones. Another way of saying that is infants. With their infants, their wives, and their children. Now notice, after all the families stood before God, the entire families. Bowing before God, wanting to know what God had to say. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. That's a mouthful, isn't it? But I want you to notice they bow before God. Then the Spirit of the Lord is there. And he said, listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. That says the Lord to you. This is because the families were bowing before God. It's a direct result of that. The prophet said, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed at this great horde or enemy or army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. You see what he's saying to these families? If you read this account, they win the victory, don't even fire a shot. Now they're going to be told, right after this verse, tomorrow, march down. The Valley of Ziz, if you will. And uh, you remember me telling you, I would have had a question at that time, but I, I, I thought you said the battle's not ours. God says, but you still have to march, you still have to be obedient. So here we are, Jesus Christ, for the sake of every individual, every family unit, Jesus went to the cross. He won the battle. You listen to me, church? And we are to march in the Lord's army. It takes courage to raise a family. Men, it takes courage to be the man of, man of, the, of the house. I know, I've been there, I'm still there. I've had two men, one man told me, he said, he said well, I know I'm the head of the house because my wife told me I was. Another man said, I'm the head of the house, but my wife's the neck that turns the head. And the reality of it is, another sermon, another time, I'll get to that. Far too many men, or too few men, know how to be the head of the house. They don't know what it involves. If you've read my marriage book, you'll find in there I have what I've always used is a, that watermelon seed syndrome. A lot of people believe being the head of the house is you just mash down on the wife and as long as you're just like watermelon seeds at a picnic table and you mash down on them, they squirt out. And you know, My brother and I used to love to do that, hit each other in the forehead with watermelon seeds, trying to squirt those things. Some men have that idea about raising a family and being the head of the house. They're going to mash down just like on the watermelon seed. They don't care whether the wife squirts or the rest of the family does as long as she squirts. Because I'm man, hear me roar. And the idea of being the head of the house encompasses living in an obedience to God's word and His will. And it's about love and nurturing. And the wife following the leadership of her husband because he is that example that she sees of love and support and security because he's wrapped up all in the idea of serving Almighty God. That's what it's all about. You had a chance to say amen there and you just let it go. Let me say this. Close with this right here. And by the way, while I'm on it, just as a side note, Talking about a coward who ever broke into 
Jack and Jerry Ross's home, that's as low life as it gets right there. And I'm certainly going to be praying about that. But as we look at this, I'm reminded of this poem that all of us probably know that involves us and our children. I have one daughter that's 41, the other one that's 37. My baby's 37. Vicky's getting old. And those girls still call me, Karen calls me D. And Karen's princess. Christy's baby duck, always has been, always will be. She calls me daddy. Those girls still sit in my lap, still flash those baby blues at me, and I mess with them something fierce. But I love them. I'd do anything in the world for them except sin. Everybody understand? And I know you feel the same way about your children. That's what being godly is about, but Listen to the truth of this. I took a piece of plastic clay and idly fashioned it one day. And as my fingers pressed it still, it moved and yielded at my will. I came again when days were past. The bit of clay was hard at last. The form I gave it still it bore, but I could change that form no more. I took a piece of living clay and gently formed it day by day. And molded with my power and art, a young child's soft and yielding heart. I came again when days were gone. It was a man I looked upon. The early impress or imprint still he wore. And I could change it nevermore. We have one shot that raising our children, we better get it right. The family unit, the most important unit, the most important thing, other than becoming a child of God, to which we're going to be part of making sure it's right, making sure it's holy, making sure it's godly. There's a challenge there. For moms and dads to step up, for children to be obedient. There's a challenge there so that one day all of us can go victoriously through Revelation 21, 21, those pearly gates and those streets of gold. I realize it's figurative, but the family isn't. It's as literal as it gets. There's no more serious thing on this earth than to be part of making sure those that we love are right with God. Maybe someone here today that needs to respond. Respond to the invitation for baptism, for repentance, whatever it might be. Won't you come as we stand and sing?